Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today, our journey through the Razzie Worst Picture winners brings us to the year 2009, where the winner was Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. I've already reviewed this movie on the show, as well as most of the movies in the franchise, but instead of simply taking a second look at Revenge of the Fallen and its fellow nominees that year, I thought it might be fun to do a retrospective on the Transformers movie franchise as a whole. Though it occurs to me, fun may not necessarily be the right word. For better or worse, Transformers has been a huge part of Hollywood for well over a decade. Six movies in the can with two more on the way, and combined box office revenue of nearly five billion dollars. The movie going public could not get enough of these films based on a popular children's toy line, though most critics tended to feel differently. Out of the first five movies, all directed by Michael Bay, only the first managed to score above 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. The rest didn't even come close. This changed with the most recent movie, but we'll get to that. And it is amazing that despite how critically reviled this franchise is, its Razzie win count is surprisingly low. In fact, Revenge of the Fallen is the only movie that won Worst Picture. The first movie only had one nomination, John Voight for Worst Supporting Actor. Dark of the Moon had eight nominations, but that was the year Jack and Jill swept the award, so no wins. Age of Extinction had seven nominations, the most that year, and took home Worst Director for Bay and Worst Supporting Actor for Kelsey Grammer, which is a f***ing joke. He was the best part of that movie. And The Last Night had ten nominations, again, the most that year, but it didn't win a single award despite being widely regarded as the worst movie in the franchise. But anyway, Michael Bay's Transformers didn't start out terrible. I've said before that when I saw Transformers in 2007, I was underwhelmed, but I still thought it was a decent movie. And after re-watching Transformers and all of its sequels, I stand by that. Transformers isn't great, and I don't think it even came close to living up to the hype, but it's fine. There are some things it did really well. They got Peter Cullen, the original voice of Optimus Prime from the 1980s cartoon, to reprise his role. The robots looked amazing, and still do. It had some cool action sequences, and in terms of characterization, they got Optimus Prime and Megatron exactly right. It's you and me, Megatron. No, it's just me, Prime. This movie had moments of greatness. However, it also did a few things not so well. While I mostly enjoyed the robots, the humans were another matter. Sam Witwicky, played by Shia LaBeouf, is annoying as hell, and he would not get better as the series went on. I'm still not sure why Hollywood thought he was leading man material. I don't necessarily think he's a bad actor, but they looked at this. <laughs> And they thought, oh yeah, that's money. Okay, you got me there. And it wasn't just Sam. His parents are annoying. The soldiers were annoying. Agent Simmons, played by John Turturro, is annoying. The comedy sidekick, played by Anthony Anderson, is annoying. And also way too old for the role. I'm pretty sure his character is supposed to be in his early 20s, and Anderson was 37 at the time. I don't know who they thought they were fooling. And some of the comedic elements really did not land for me. I did like Bumblebee's attempts at communicating through the radio. I did not particularly care for... this. Bumblebee, stop lubricating the man. And while the movie had some cool action sequences, there were a few missteps in that department as well. Michael Bay is pejoratively known as the explosions guy, and not without reason, but he is legitimately very good at creating some exciting, compelling images on screen. Especially if you have a hard-on for the military like he clearly does. What he's not very good at is giving the audience a clear picture of where everything is in relation to everything else. The movie's final battle in the fictional Mission City, which was retconned in later movies to Los Angeles, does a pretty good job of highlighting this. While the humans and robots are shooting at each other, it's not always clear where the robots are in relation to the humans. Take this scene with Sam racing to the top of a building. First he's in a stairwell. Then he's running down this corridor while Megatron tries to kill him. Then he's suddenly in another stairwell? Why did he need to run from one stairwell to the other? And why is Megatron no longer chasing him after he gets to the stairs? Where did he go? Were the stairs declared home base before the start of the fight so he can't be tagged there? What's going on? 
And one of the most common retorts for critics of the Transformers movies is, well, what did you expect from a movie about robots fighting? Well, I'll tell you. In a movie about robots fighting, I expect... Robots fighting! Imagine that! And yes, we do get some moments with robots fighting, but even those aren't always done well. The first time we see robots fighting each other is the fight between Bumblebee and Barricade. But as soon as they start fighting, we cut to Sam and Michaela, played by Megan Fox, fighting a smaller Decepticon whose name I don't recall and honestly, I don't care. Once they finish him off, we cut back to Bumblebee who... has already defeated Barricade, I guess. No idea what happened to Barricade, he's just gone. Their fight happens almost entirely off screen. Now the filmmakers said they wanted to tell the story from a human perspective in order to better connect to their audience, and I get that. I don't disagree with that idea, but you have to remember this is still a story about robots fighting, and you just actively denied your audience robots fighting. What are you even doing here? So while Transformers was a decent movie, the signs of trouble were there from day one. And with the next two movies in the franchise, Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, instead of improving on those elements, they cranked them up to 11. The human character somehow got more annoying, especially when Sam's mom inadvertently tries an edible and reacts in exactly the opposite way someone would act on weed. Pro tip, Mikey, it's not an upper. Most of the jokes still don't land, and despite having his voice repaired at the end of the first movie, Bumblebee's voice has mysteriously broken again, and he's back to communicating through the radio. By this point, the joke had run its course, and it just wasn't funny anymore. But that didn't stop them from keeping it going for four more movies. And while the lubricating from the first movie was pretty dumb, it wasn't the low point for the franchise. That came in Revenge of the Fallen. I am directly below! Enemy scrotum! They say every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. I don't know what the opposite of an angel getting its wings is, but that's what happens every time I hear that line. Turturro deserve better. Bay still has no concept of where things are in relation to other things, and this even extends to simple geography. Michaela, who is on the West Coast, has a phone call one day with Sam, who is attending college on the East Coast. She then immediately books a flight, drives to the airport, checks a bag, gets through post 9-11 security, flies to the other side of the country, and finds Sam while there's still daylight to spare. The cross-country flight alone would be four hours at least, and cross three time zones. And yet it looks like it's noon when she arrives. Space is warped and time is bendable. There are still issues with the robots fighting. Half the time we can't see it because there's shit in the way, and the other half we can't see it because it happens entirely off camera. I've lost track of how many times the Autobots are fighting alongside the humans, and then they inexplicably disappear for a bit, leaving the humans all alone until they suddenly show up again to save the day. Where were they? What were they doing? I don't know, and the movie certainly isn't going to tell you. What really baffles me is this scene in Dark of the Moon where the Autobots have been captured. Why is it baffling? Because literally three minutes before this scene, they hadn't been captured. Whatever led to their capture happened instantly and completely off screen. In fact, there's a lot of stuff in Dark of the Moon that happens completely off screen. I am convinced that there is a four hour cut of this movie sitting in a vault somewhere, and it should probably stay there but I confess I am just a little bit curious because this cannot have been the original plan. There are just too many gaps in the story. Speaking of ridiculously long cuts, the franchise developed some new problems as it went on, and one of them was the runtime. It didn't get longer per se. All five movies are about two and a half hours, give or take, but they felt longer. The first movie filled its runtime pretty well. It wasn't any longer than it needed to be. Starting with Revenge of the Fallen, this was no longer the case. That movie dragged robotic ass, and this problem would have been so easy to fix. About an hour and 20 minutes in, they meet a rather cranky Decepticon defector called Jetfire, who sends them on a quest to find the Matrix of Leadership. But he doesn't know exactly where it is, so they have to go on this pointless quest to decode some stupid puzzle and figure out where it's hidden. If Jetfire could have just told them where the Matrix was, that would have easily knocked about a half hour off this movie's runtime. And anything that makes Revenge of the Fallen take less time to get through, I consider an improvement. Dark of the Moon is in a very odd position as it had similar pointless scenes that needlessly extended the runtime, but as I said before, the story also has some weird gaps where something should happen but doesn't. It is simultaneously too long and not long enough. 
That shouldn't be physically possible, but here we are. Revenge of the Fallen also introduced some casual racism to the franchise in the form of Skids and Mudflap, the wannabe gangster robots with gold teeth who, in their own words, don't do much reading. God, these two make re-watching this movie so awkward. Much has been said about these two characters already, I've said plenty myself, and I won't repeat myself here. But God, what were they thinking? How did Bay not see the backlash coming? Is he that stupid? Why do you ask questions to which you already know the answers? And we know Bay didn't see it coming because Skids and Mudflap were supposed to return for Dark of the Moon. In fact, they are in the background of one shot, which shows you how late in production they got before deciding to remove them. And that is the tale of the ill-fated Skids and Mudflap. And let us never speak of them again. Another problem introduced by Revenge of the Fallen, Ladies and gentlemen, the male gaze. This is just plain ridiculous. I'm surprised the camera isn't constantly shaking due to the furious masturbation Bay must have been doing during this shot. There's nothing wrong with women appearing sexy on camera, but there's a right way to do that, and then there's whatever the honey roasted f this is. No wonder Fox left the franchise after this movie. I can't blame her. And you know they didn't plan on her leaving because Sam's new girlfriend in Dark of the Moon, played by Rosie Huntington Whitley, was clearly supposed to be Michaela. They threw in one extra line of dialogue to explain why she's familiar with the Autobots, and that was about the only change they made. Otherwise, the movie acts as if she is Michaela, right down to the gazy camera work. And if all that weren't enough, they also introduced some really stupid elements to the plot. First, there was the idea that the governments of the world would have been able to cover up the multiple giant robot battles that have been happening across the globe. I thought I knew what preposterous was until this. I've said before that my suspension of disbelief can only go so far. There is a line, and Transformers didn't just step over that line, it did a world record setting long jump over it. There's also the fact that several major characters end up getting killed only to be resurrected later. Twice in Megatron's case. This creates two problems. First, it kills any semblance of stakes when a character dies since Optimus, Megatron, and hell, even Sam were easily brought back to life. Second, it looks really stupid when another character is permanently killed. If you could bring Optimus back, why couldn't you resurrect Ironhide or Jazz? Why is the power of resurrection so arbitrary? It just raises too many questions. And this brings us to the fourth movie in the franchise, Age of Extinction, where they at least gave us the impression that they were going to take things in a different direction. And indeed, they did make some improvements. The entire cast of human characters was replaced. The ever-annoying Shia LaBeouf was swapped out for Mark Wahlberg as Cade Yeager, a professional wrestling stage name if ever I heard one. They dropped the ridiculous premise of the government covering up the existence of the Transformers. They did have an annoying comedy sidekick played by TJ Miller, but killed him off in the first act. Thank you for that. Kelsey Grammer was an excellent villain, and they added Stanley Tucci, and he makes everything better. Well, almost everything, but we'll get to that. And these were all genuine and, might I add, welcome improvements. I've said before that Age of Extinction is one of the better movies in the franchise, and I stand by that. However, better is a relative term, and it still has some of the same problems that keep it from being a good movie. It's still unnecessarily long, largely because this movie has essentially two plots that could easily be their own separate movie. The first involves an assassin Transformer named Lockdown who is working with the government to hunt down Optimus Prime and the surviving Autobots. While those exact same government agents constantly claim mankind needs to stop working with Transformers and fight their own battles. So they're working with Transformers in order to stop working with Transformers. Huh? What kind of a man betrays his flesh and blood brethren for alien metal? Look in the mirror, you'll find your answer. And the second involves a company trying to build their own Transformers, which leads to the creation of Galvatron, who is basically Megatron resurrected. Again. This culminates in Optimus Prime finding the Dinobots, who, unlike their animated counterparts, do not talk. Yes, I am still bitter about that. And we get a massive battle with the Dinobots joining forces with the Autobots to take out Galvatron and his army. And I'm not gonna lie, Optimus riding into battle on Grimlock is an amazing visual. The problem is this fight with Galvatron should be the movie's climax. Once that's over, that should be the end of the movie. But oh wait, we still have to fight Lockdown. 
And so the movie drags on and on and on. And speaking of fights, there's still a serious lack of robots fighting in the movie about robots fighting. And much of said fighting happens off screen or in the background. The characters are inconsistent as hell. When Kane and his daughter first run into trouble with the evil government agents, the daughter's boyfriend bravely leaps into action to rescue them. But about an hour later, he magically turns into a coward. And all for the sake of a dumb joke. Oh yeah, the jokes are still dumb. And it's still very gazy, which gets really awkward since the target of said gaze is Cade's daughter, Tessa, played by Nicola Peltz. The character is 17. The actress at the time was 16. A man in his 40s is sexualizing a 16-year-old girl. God damn it, babe, what is your deal? Oh, and that's not all. I know I already talked about this when I reviewed Age of Extinction, but I have to come back to it because it is easily the most baffling decision made in this film franchise. Tessa is 17. Her boyfriend is 20. This would be illegal in some states, but it's A-OK -okay in the state of Texas due to their Romeo and Juliet law, which the boyfriend keeps a laminated copy of in his wallet. Every time I think about this movie, I keep coming back to the same question. Why? Why is this in the movie? It's not funny. It doesn't add anything apart from the few minutes of runtime that they use to explain why their relationship is legal. No one liked it. No one understood it. Why is it in the movie? I suspect I may regret learning the answer, but I still want to know the answer. Anyway, despite this weirdness, Age of Extinction was at least an attempt to breathe new life into a franchise that was starting to get stale at this point. And it didn't entirely succeed, but it was at least a step in the right direction. Things were looking up. Then we got The Last Night, which screwed everything up. Nothing in this movie makes any sense. Not one lick of it. Despite the last movie indicating Cade and the Autobots would no longer have any trouble from the government, they still have trouble from the government and have gone into hiding. But his daughter is away at college and the government is not after her for reasons that are never adequately explained. In place of his daughter, he befriends a 14-year-old streetwise urchin named Isabella, played by Isabella Monaire, and her pet robot Squeaks. And thankfully, she is not sexualized because even Michael Bay has limits. Also, they have baby Dinobots now. How exactly are there baby Dinobots? And why are there baby Dinobots? I mean, it does give them some more toys to sell. And I just answered my own question. Carry on. They went to the trouble of bringing back Josh Dumel and John Turturro, though the latter is also in hiding and only appears via a series of expositional phone calls. Turturro is quite literally phoning it in. Laura Haddock is the new female lead and basically British Megan Fox, and the movie isn't even trying to pretend otherwise. Stanley Tucci is back, but only in a flashback scene as a drunk Merlin. Yes, that Merlin. We'll come back to that. And Anthony Hopkins... I don't know what the fuck he was doing in this movie, and I'm not sure he knew either. Yes, but you want to know, don't you, dude? This is bad comedy. There's still not nearly enough robots fighting. Hell, most of the Autobots basically disappear for the second act. So does Cage Young's new sidekick. I'm honestly not sure she's in enough of the movie to qualify as a sidekick. Optimus Prime, who we saw flying off into space at the end of Age of Extinction, is also barely in the movie. Galvatron is once again Megatron. This is not explained. There's still a lot of stuff that happens off camera, like when Cade and British Megan Fox find an old submarine that turns out to be a Transformer, and we're told the sub unmoors itself, but we never actually see that happen. Hey Mikey, show, don't tell. The editing is an absolute nightmare. Like the other movies, The Last Night is about two and a half hours long, and it somehow feels rushed. The editing is incredibly frantic, with lightning quick cuts, even and especially when there is no need for it. Characters instantly switch positions between cuts, there's very little sense of how much time passes between scenes, lines of dialogue go by so fast I'm amazed any of the actors have time to breathe. Can't the thing's pretty crazy. It's none of your business. Stop flirting. I heard a rumor when this movie was in production that it would be three hours long. Based on how it turned out, I can believe Bay originally delivered a three hour cut, or longer, and they hastily trimmed it down to two and a half. The plot is the hottest of hot messes. Basically, the Transformers have been on Earth for much longer than previously thought, going all the way back to the days of King Arthur and the Wizard Merlin. Also, those of you who have seen the original animated movie will remember Unicron, the giant planet-destroying Transformer. In this movie, Unicron is Earth. 
and he's starting to wake up. That's bad. Cade and British Megan Fox must go on the sort of needlessly long and complicated quest that seems to happen frequently in these movies, except this time the Autobots are barely involved. Even Bumblebee, and he's pretty much the star of this franchise, at least as far as the merch is concerned. And they have to track down the staff of Merlin, which I think can somehow put Unicron back to sleep, it's not entirely clear. And there's also a medallion that turns into Excalibur, and somehow Stonehenge is involved. I swear, this is actually a Transformers movie. Optimus Prime ends up on Cybertron and meets his maker, Quintessa, who brainwashes him and tells him to take Merlin's staff and use it to merge Earth with Cybertron, which will destroy Earth and restore Cybertron to its former glory. Apparently, the staff can do that too. And so, Optimus Prime becomes Nemesis Prime. For about five minutes, and then Bumblebee brings him back. Not even joking. And it seems like the movie is implying Megatron was also brainwashed by Quintessa, as he has a red mark on his face similar to Optimus when he was brainwashed, but we never actually see this happen, so who knows. Also, British Megan Fox is part of an ancient bloodline that makes her the only human being on Earth capable of using Merlin's staff, which is literally the only thing she does in the movie. She grabs the staff right at the very end and saves the day. And despite having this magical bloodline, Cade, not British Megan Fox, is the character referred to as the Chosen One. WTF to that. I must sound like a crazy person the way I'm describing this movie, but I swear, all of this actually happens. And yes, it makes absolutely no sense, even when compared to the previous movies, which is an astounding feat. And by the end of the movie, Quintessa has been stopped, but is somehow still alive and in human form, and Unicron is still there and a potential threat, so essentially at the end of the movie, we're in the exact same place we were in at the beginning of the movie. The Last Knight spends two and a half hours accomplishing nothing. Basically, the purpose of this movie was to lay the groundwork for future movies, but in the process, they forgot to, you know, do their own thing. And there were plans for more movies. Oh lordy, there were plans. They had as many as 14 stories completed for potential future films. Unfortunately, these plans did not come to fruition as even fans of the franchise were burned out by this point, and who could blame them? Between the nonsensical plot, the multitude of ridiculous elements they tried to cram into said plot, characters randomly appearing and disappearing, and the insanely frantic editing, Transformers The Last Night is as if the very concept of ADHD made a movie. It became the first of Michael Bay's Transformers films to lose money to the tune of about $100 million, leaving the future of the franchise in jeopardy. Writers bailed, Bay had no interest in directing another movie, no one wanted a sequel to The Last Night, even the diehard fans, so the studio finally decided it was time to hit the reset button. Or the reboot button, rather. And that brings us to the latest entry in the series, Bumblebee. AKA The Good Movie! Oh my god, they finally did it! It took them over a decade, but heaven and earth rejoice, they finally made a good Transformers movie. How did they do it? Well, basically, they made E.T., but with giant robots. Hey, it worked! While Bay stayed on as a producer, the director's chair was handed over to Travis Knight in his first live-action film. He is otherwise known for directing, well, most of Laika's catalog. The screenplay came from Christina Hodson, who had previously written Shut In and Unforgettable? She went from that to Bumblebee? Is there an award for most improved screenwriter? Because hot damn! The plot is pretty straightforward, which is a welcome change after the last night, let me tell ya. The war for Cybertron is not going well for the Autobots, so Optimus Prime sends Bumblebee to establish a new base of operations. He lands on Earth in the year 1987, but inadvertently attracts the attention of the US military and the Decepticon Blitzwing, who destroys Bumblebee's voice box, yeah, they went with that again, and damages his memory core. With significant injuries and fading memories, there's little he can do but go into hiding as a Volkswagen Beetle. He ultimately ends up in the possession of young social outcast Charlie Wilson, played by Haley Steinfeld, who inadvertently reactivates B and holy shit, I've got an alien robot in my garage! And the two become fast friends and various misadventures ensue. Meanwhile, two Decepticons, Shatter and Dropkick, also arrive on Earth. Pretending to come in peace, they convince the humans to grant them access to their resources so they can capture the renegade Bumblebee and help defend the Earth. 
And of course, their real plan is to kill Bumblebee, contact Megatron, and bring the Decepticons here and take over. Considering how the previous movies went, my expectations were low, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. To say it surpassed my expectations is an understatement. This was the one movie out of the six that I was actually excited to rewatch, mainly because of Haley Steinfeld and everyone's favorite yellow robots. She is a welcome change from the previous movie's leads. Cade was fine, but nothing special, and Sam had the kind of face that demanded punching. Charlie, on the other hand, is a character that's much easier to sympathize with. I actually want to root for her. She's been feeling depressed since the death of her father, and it doesn't help that her mother's new beau, while arguably well-meaning, is a bit of a jackass. I really think it's gonna change your whole life. I'll give you some smile more often. Oh, no he didn't. Steinfeld absolutely nailed this performance, which, based on what I've seen of her previous work, is not at all surprising. She's fantastic, and her relationship with B is almost militantly adorable. I mean, look at him. He's like a little lost puppy, who is also a giant robot that turns into a car. It's the second most adorable thing I've ever seen. The first is Grogu, obviously, but this is close. Their bonding over what they've lost is genuinely touching. Charlie teaching B how to hide is the funniest goddamn thing. And I'll be the first to admit I was a bit disappointed that they went back to the old gimmick of B losing his voice, but they actually made it work, and I loved watching Charlie teach B how to find his voice through music. Lost was found. I do like the 1980s aesthetic. It's actually rather appropriate considering that's when the original toy line came to be. I do admit I may be biased since I grew up on the original toy line and the cartoon that came with it, and this movie is pressing that nostalgia button and pressing it hard. The Transformers in this movie bear a much stronger resemblance to their G1 counterparts. Bumblebee transforms into a beetle again instead of a Camaro, for most of the movie anyway. The soundtrack is very 80s, and they even threw in the touch for good measure. And I love the gag where Charlie's neighbor Memo is briefly shown reading a GoBots comic. I freely acknowledge most people who saw this movie probably did not understand that gag. And I'm okay with that. That one was for me. Speaking of Memo, played by Jorge Lendeborg Jr., he is a comedy sidekick of sorts, as well as Charlie's potential love interest, maybe, possibly, will they, won't they, who knows? Yeah, mm. Quite there yet. Fine, be that way. But unlike previous comedy sidekicks in the franchise, he's not annoying as hell. He's a likable character and actually funny. His comedic timing is excellent, and he's able to be funny without acting like he just drank 17 Red Bulls. In fact, most of the jokes in this movie actually land. Imagine that. John Cena especially got to show off his comedic chops as Colonel Jack Burns. The paintball gag where we first meet the character is hilarious, and I love his reaction to the military agreeing to work with Shatter and Dropkick. Humans working with the obviously evil robots has been a staple of this franchise because humans are stupid, but I think this is the first time anyone has pointed out the obvious flaw in such an alliance. They literally call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't set off any red flags. Thank you! Oh, and do you actually expect to have robots fighting in your movie about robots fighting? Well, guess what? We got robots fighting! And the fighting is actually, get this, good! The action sequences are shot well and choreographed well. They're a lot of fun to watch. B apparently learned some Lucha Libre while he was stuck in Charlie's garage. This is awesome! And if all that wasn't enough, this movie clocks in at just under two hours. I'm gonna say that again. A Transformers movie is under two hours! <sighs> Does anybody have a cigarette? If I haven't made this clear by now, I love Bumblebee so much. Basically, everything the previous movies got wrong, Bumblebee got right. And what the previous movies got right, Bumblebee got really right. This is what I've been asking for since 2007. Was it that damn hard? I mean, if you really want me to nitpick, I can give you a minor complaint. The scene where B sneaks into the house and starts breaking shit out of ignorance is kinda tropey. It's been done. Although, if you've seen the deleted scenes, you know it could have been worse. The editors made the right call there. But overall, it's fantastic. Rewatching all of these movies was a bit of a chore for obvious reasons, but at least I got to end on a high note. Although this isn't really the end, because the series will continue next year with Rise of the Beasts. And for the people working on that movie, please, more of this. You are on the right track. Stay there. Well, that's the live-action Transformers film franchise as of 2022. 
In summary, decent, crap, crap, meh, steaming pile of crap, cigarette. No surprise that they've all had their share of Razzie nominations, and yes, that technically includes Bumblebee as it was nominated for the Razzie Redeemer, but lost to Melissa McCarthy for Can You Ever Forgive Me? Which is hilarious considering she was nominated for Worst Actress that same year. So she did redeem herself, but apparently only at the last minute. She was really good in that movie, though. Bumblebee is the only movie in the live-action series that I can recommend without hesitation. Maybe give the first movie your Age of Extinction a watch if they happen to show up on cable, but I wouldn't recommend seeking them out. And avoid the other three like a sensible person avoids the plague. And it's sad that I have to qualify that expression, but we are living in the dumbest timeline. And now let us never speak of Revenge of the Fallen again. Next time, we are moving ahead to the year 2010, which means we are going to revisit... Oh, God. The Last Airbender. Shyamalan! And if all that wasn't enough, this movie clocks in at just under two hours. I'm going to say that again. <coughs> no, I'm not. <clears throat>